Good morning, everybody. Can you hear me? That was kind of a joke. It's pretty loud, isn't it? I hope you can hear me on the Facebook also. Um, I just wanted to welcome you guys with my mask on, um, so that way you won't get scared this morning. Just kidding. It was an ugly joke about face mask. Anyway, um, I just want to encourage, uh, remind you guys that you know we are still um, trying to abide by as many of the guidelines that we've been asked to abide by that we can. <coughs> um, I know we are meeting, and we're doing that because we believe that this is just something that's essential for, for people's lives, <laughs> especially at this time. And so, but we want to make sure it's a safe place for everyone, um, whether you are very comfortable um, gathering or very uncomfortable with gathering. And so we've tried to make it where you have many options. Um, we have a speaker outside if you worry about being inside and singing inside, that you can go outside and sing. We ask that if you sing, you do sing with a mask on. And if that bothers you, then feel, please feel free to go outside and sing with your mask off um, and, and maintain you know, some, some social um, physical distance while you do that. I, I say we do physical distance, but social solidarity. So, um, but, but, but whatever you do, keep each other in mind. <laughs> know that the person um, around you may be less comfortable than you are. And, and so, you know, maintain distance, respect boundaries, and, and just make sure that we keep this a, a safe place for everybody who <laughs> has a need to gather together to worship. All right? Let me pray for us, and then we'll begin our, our time of worship through music. Father, we love you so much, and I thank you for, man, I thank you for your grace. I thank you for your faithfulness that no matter what's going on in the world, no matter what's going on in our lives, no matter um, how we succeed or fail, that you're right there, you're consistent, and you, you're always calling us back to rest in you. And so, man, God, I, I pray that, that this morning we could enjoy your presence together, mm -hmm. that you would be worshiped and, and glorified in our praise and that our hearts would be magnified in you together so that we might go out and represent you to this world. Mm -hmm. I pray this in Jesus' name. <coughs> Amen. Amen.
failures, bring your addictions, come lay them down at the foot of the cross. Jesus is waiting there, God so loved the Good morning. Uh, as we continue with our worship, I just want to share with you from Psalm 31. Uh, this is from the Passion Translation. It says, Lord, I'm bursting with joy over what you've done for me. My lips are full of perpetual praise. I'm boasting of you and all your works. So let all who are discouraged take heart. Join me, everyone. Let's praise the Lord together. Let's make him famous. Let's make his name glorious to all. Listen to my testimony. I cried to God in my distress, and he answered me. He freed me from all my fears. Gaze upon him. Join your life with his, and joy will come. Your faces will glisten with glory. You'll never wear that shame face again. So today, let's celebrate the freedom that is ours, the freedom that is ours through Jesus Christ. And let's just declare together that we are here for no other reason than for him.
Amen. Um, we're free in Christ unless there's a pandemic. <laughs> That's not true, is it? We're free in life. We're, we're, we're free at last unless we're going through a hard time in life. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Where is the Spirit not? You know, that, that's, that's one of the great hopes, the great truths that Christ has shown us by becoming a human and dying on a cross is that there's nowhere where we can't find life. Life has gone through it all. <laughs> life himself. Life has gone through death and suffering and abandonment. I mean, he's, 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 gone, he's gone through it all. And so we, we never have to wait for situations or circumstances to be a certain way before we start living because life is there in the midst of it all. He's the Prince of Peace and he's a man of sorrows acquainted with grief. And that's why we can have peace in the midst of sorrow. You know, whatever, whatever you've been going through, and for many of us, whatever we're going through, if it's negative things in life, that it's multiplied because of everything that goes in with all this COVID junk. There's freedom wherever you are. There's freedom wherever you are. That's right. And you don't have to pay for it. You don't have to earn it. You, you, you don't have to pay penance. You don't have to feel bad about yourself for a set amount of time before you can rest in His grace again. Thank God. I mean, it's... I, I know it, 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 it's, it's like too good to be true and it feels wrong to be that loved and that accepted like all the time like that. Sorry, that's just who God is. And we glorify Him when we receive Him for who He is. What a fun way to glorify God. Walk in His grace. That's not what we're talking about this morning. This morning, the message is about judgment, and I'm not kidding. <laughs> we're, we're going. <laughs> we're going through Romans, and um, the first the first segment of Romans. The whole point of it all is. There's no distinction between Jew and Gentile in that we all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God and we all deserve judgment apart from Jesus. And that's where we are. We're in Romans chapter 2 and we're going to be there until 3.20 and then we'll, maybe we'll turn a corner that, that then, then, you know, that from 3.20 to six, chapter 6 is, is, is there's no distinction between Jew and Gentile in that justification comes through Christ. And, and so, but, but, the judgment we talked about the past couple of weeks, the judgment is an important part of the message. And, and quite frankly, it's a message of, of, of hope when we realize there's nothing we can do to dodge the judgment. That's a message of hope because that means you don't have to do it. It's been done for us. Jesus has done it. It's a message of hope to know. It's a message of hope, of hope for me to know that you're just as messed up as I am. And that my identity in Christ or, or in myself or whatever is not dependent on me measuring up to you or your judgments. It's a message of hope that we're all in this together. We can't do it, and it's been done for us, and we can abide in what's been done for us. So it's not a fun subject, but it's a necessary subject. Today we're going to roll into Romans chapter 2. And uh, um, I think we still have a few. Of, will you, Michelle, will you hold up your little handy-dandy? We have these, these little book uh, uh, of Romans. It's, it's, it's Romans, and, and it's got the text on one side and then places for notes on the other. And if, if, if you want one, um, 
I, I think they're actually under the, um, is, James, is James in here? James stepped out. Um, when James comes back in, we'll holler at him, and he'll, 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 he'll pass some of those out. I, I think we have a handful of them left. So, yeah, we're going to talk about, talk about judgment, and, and, and it's an uncomfortable subject, though. And, and I think that one of the reasons it's an uncomfortable subject is because there's been kind of this growing trend, and, and, and it's kind of weird because I kind of see both sides of this. You know, on one side, I see that a lot of times the church kind of really fails at the whole judgment thing. We're pretty, we can be pretty judgmental. A lot of times the Christians are known more for what, <clears throat> what we're against than who we follow, and that's a bummer, you know? You, you go and you ask, uh, there, there's a book called, I think, Unchristian, and they went and they asked a bunch of people what, how to describe Christians. The number one answer, can you guess what the number one answer is? Huh? They, they, they don't like homosexuals. That was the number one answer. <laughs> I mean, what a bummer, right? Following Jesus who, like, died for sinners, and the number one answer is, oh, they hate people who, you know, have this particular sin. Yeah, they hate people who sin. <laughs> Come on, man. So, like, like and, and, and sometimes we, when, when you get in the church, sometimes it feels like it's, it's hey, you're saved by grace. Um, uh, Mike's got some, um, there's just two left. So we got two left. Let's, let's we, can, we can put a little fighting pit over here and we can fight over them. Okay. Um, so, yeah, even when you get in the church sometimes it can feel like, it's, it's like, hey, you're saved by grace. You're saved by grace through faith, not as a result of works so that no one may boast. Now get your act together or get out. Like sometimes it can feel like that. And so, um, but I've also seen kind of a growing trend in our culture of, 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 of saying that, 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 that it's, it's really evil to be judgmental. You don't need to be intolerant. You need to be tolerant of, of, of people. Don't, don't, don't say that you're better than somebody else by looking down on their lifestyle kind of, kind of a deal. And, 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 I, and I think that, that that's one reason why talking about judgment is, is so uncomfortable is because we, we're, we've been trained to not want to judge each other. And when God comes across as this judgmental guy, we're like, ah, uh, you know, is, is, is the world going to accept this kind of a God? maybe, or it just feels mean. Um, but in our study of Romans, we've got to investigate this I idea because if we can't say that what someone is doing is wrong, how can we preach that there's judgment for those who do wrong things? You see how we, we've got to sort through this a little bit. And, and today's passage, I think, lands us right in this discussion, uh, maybe not intentionally, but, but it lands us right in this discussion of, is it wrong to judge the actions of someone else? And so we're going to look at what Paul says in Romans chapter 2, verses 1 through 2. So let's, let's go ahead and jump in. Romans 2, 1 through 2. Paul says, Therefore, you have no excuse, O man, every one of you who judges. For in passing judgment on another, you condemn yourself. Because you, the judge... Practice the very same things. We know that the judgment of God rightly falls on those who practice such things. Just take, take a, maybe take a second and read, read over that yourself. I think that Paul is being a big fat hypocrite right here. Take a second and read over that and see if you see any hypocrisy in what Paul just said. I'll, I'll, yeah, yeah. T take a second and read it for yourself. Judging them for judging. How dare you judge people, you horrible judgers? You see that? So Paul says that judging others is bad because the judgers are usually ones doing the same things, if not things just as bad. That's a good point. But then he makes a statement that we, we all know that God judges people who do the sort of things that we're talking about. God judges people for the things that we might judge others for and, and that others might judge us for. So we shouldn't judge others because we probably do the same sort of thing, at least other things that are worthy to be judged. And we all know that God's judgment rightly falls on pe people who do such things. So Paul's judging the judger for judging. Say that five times fast. So <laughs> he says we shouldn't judge. It's bad to judge. 
which is judging judges for judging. Then he invites us all into his judging of everybody when he says, and we all know that the judgment of God rightly falls on those people. <laughs> right? So he judges the judger and then invites us all to judge everybody. Why? He says, don't judge. Now, uh, now, now to, be, to, be, to be fair, to be fair, at least he's consistent. You know, maybe, maybe, maybe he's, he's, he's literally saying uh, that, that, that in judging the judges, he condemns himself because he practices the very same thing. R right? We all know we practice the very same thing. So if he's judging the judges for judging, then he's practicing the same things and so condemns himself for judging the judges. Are you with me? It's a, very, it's a very fun passage to just sit on for a while, isn't it? Let's push pause on our discussion of Paul's judgmental judging of the judging judges and agree together that it's a good thing that our salvation is not based on the hypocritical judgments of man, but upon the grace of God. Whew. No matter what else we walk away with this morning, let's hold on to that. But I want to look, I want to, I want to dive into this idea. Is it okay to judge each other? Is it okay to look at something in the life of another person and say, that's wrong. You shouldn't do that. Well, Jesus said something a lot like this in, in Matthew chapter 7, verses 1 through 6. Go ahead. Jesus says this, judge not that you be not judged. For with the judgment you pronounce, you will be judged, and with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Why do you see the speck that's in your brother's eye, but don't notice the log that's in your own eye? That's funny. Isn't it fun that Jesus is funny sometimes? I mean, he's serious when he needs to be serious. And, and you don't have to laugh and be funny to be a part of Jesus' team. But it's a pretty funny picture of someone with a log sticking out of their own eye trying to get a speck out of a brother's eye, beating them up <laughs> with the log out of their own eye. I mean, this is Three Stooges 101 right here. <laughs> Jesus goes on in verse 4. Or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when there's the log in your own eye? You hypocrite. First take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. Verse 6. Do not give dogs what is holy, and do not throw your pearls before pigs, lest they trample them underfoot and turn to attack you. So from the first part of what Jesus says here, it seems that Paul is like pretty in line with him, right? If you judge others, you might just be condemning yourself because you're very likely doing something that's just as bad, if not worse, than the person you're judging. So your judging kind of condemns you for judging. They might have a speck in their eye, but you might have a log in your own eye that you can't see. The measure that you use to measure others will be used to measure you. It's, it's very similar to what Paul says. Uh, but then Jesus says verse 6 here, which is kind of weird, right? Don't give dogs what is holy. Do not throw your pearls before pigs, lest they trample them underfoot and turn to attack you. Do you know what that means? Nobody does. Nobody does. Commentarier, commentar commentators, commentariers, um, those are normal dogs. They're commentariers. Um, nobody? Commentar <laughs> commentators, commentators, and those are normal, you know, potatoes. So, sorry. French fries, commentators. They um, um, will all argue about what this actually means, and there's not, there's not like this clear consensus. And I think we need to be aware that a lot of times when there's no clear consensus in Scripture, that, 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 that maybe there's, there's some mystery in there. We need to be humble about approaching those passages, you know, and, 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 and maybe receive that there may be more than one thing that that means. But, but, but he, here's at least one thing I believe we can take from this passage. Jesus expects us to know who the dogs and the pigs are. So, so now, wait a minute. If we can't judge, then how can we say, that's a dog, that's a pig? 
There's got to be some kind of judging going on, some kind of discernment going on here and even what Jesus is calling us to. So Jesus says, judge not that you be not judged and look out for those dogs and pigs. It's the same sort of difficulty we just found in Paul when he said, don't judge people. And remember that everyone who practices these sorts of things rightly deserve God's judgment. <laughs> he judged the judges and everyone else who does bad things as he told us not to judge. So what do we do with all this? Well, there's a reason why we have a whole Bible and not just a few passages taken out of context scattered around. Let's look, let's look at what it says in James 5.19. It says, and I don't have this on the slide, you just have to, to listen to me. My brothers and sisters, if anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone brings him back, let him know that whoever brings back a sinner from his wandering will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. I mean, doesn't that sound like we're supposed to pursue those among us who begin to wander from the truth? And how can we know if someone is wandering from the truth if it's wrong to look at their lives and say, hey, what they're doing is wrong. They're wandering from the truth. Galatians 6.1 says this, Brothers and sisters, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore them in a spirit of gentleness. Keep watch on yourself lest you too be tempted. Now, here's what I hear in that, in the context of what we've been talking about. Notice the speck in your brother and sister's eyes. But as you help them remove the speck, keep an eye on your eyes too. See, the, the point is not that we're not supposed to look at actions and behaviors and say that they're true or false, right or wrong. The fact, that the, the point is, is that we don't look down on people and think we're more spiritual because we don't struggle in the same way that they struggle. It's, it's the whole, uh, 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 you lift yourself up, you're going to fall. T t you know, you who are, how's the, how's it go? You who are proud, you know what I'm saying? How, how does the verse go? You who are proud, take heed lest you too fall, or something like that, right? Uh, uh, Jesus talks about it in, 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 in Luke, you know, when he, he says, uh, when you go to somebody's party, don't take the seat of the, the, the high seat lest you be asked to go down. Take, take the least seat and you'll be asked to, to come up. We should, we should move toward each other knowing that, that, that we all fail in the same ways. No temptation has overcome you except which is common to man. Just because someone struggles in a different way that, than you do doesn't make you better than them spiritually. And if you think you are, then that's spiritual pride. And that's, that's a biggie. It's a biggie. Jesus never said don't. Jesus didn't say don't ever help a brother or sister get the speck out of their eye. He said first remove the log from your own eye. Then you'll see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eyes. In other words, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Keep watch on yourself lest you too be tempted. Here's something else that Jesus said in, in Matthew chapter 7, verse 15. Go ahead. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will recognize them by their fruits. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? So every healthy tree bears good fruit, but the diseased tree bears bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus you will recognize them by their fruits. So how does Jesus expect us to identify a false prophet? By recognizing the bad fruits. If we notice consistent bad fruit, and, and you, you know, th this whole deal, can a good tree get, produce bad fruit and a bad tree produce good fruit? It's the same thing that uh, James says, can, can a spring produce both salty and fresh water at the same time? Talking about our mouth. You know, should we, can, we, can we bless God and curse man with the same mouth? The answer, the tragedy of that is yeah. <laughs> you know, I, mean, that's, I think that's the point that James is getting to is, is our mouths don't work the way they're supposed to work. <laughs> you know, I mean, thank God for the grace of God. I mean, Lord, please go before and behind my words. <laughs> you know, let them you know, protect people from my words. 
Maybe let them just hear your words whenever I speak. So, so the point is, we live in a, in a reality where, where trees do produce two different kinds of fruit, and that's it shouldn't be that way, but but it is. But by Jesus seems to be saying that if a tree is always producing this kind of fruit, it's clearly this kind of tree. And so you can tell the, these people by their fruits. So, so we're not supposed to be judgmental of each other, but we are supposed to be fruit inspectors. We're supposed to be able to discern the spirits, identify the dogs and the pigs and the false prophets. And we're supposed to notice when our brothers and sisters are living contrary to the truth, and we're supposed to help bring back the wanderer. And we're called to do all of this without judging. Who's the judge? God's the judge. So whatever we do, we don't do it judgmentally. We can, we can we cannot look at the false prophets, the dogs, the pigs, or the wanderers and say, I'm spiritually superior, superior to you. Then we've just fallen into spiritual pride and condemned ourselves. So, all this to be said, imagine, imagine with me, if you will, a community where we all believed that all of us are capable of the worst sin. That we all believed that none of us was awesome. We all believed that all of our good works were like dirty diapers compared to God. Then someone came to us and said, someone in that community came to us and said, hey, the way that you're living is not according to truth. Now, I know that that person knows that they're just as bad as I am without Jesus. And they know that I know that I am just as bad as they are without Jesus. That's why they're comfortable coming to me in the first place. And so when they say that to me, I don't get defensive because they're not putting me down. I'm like, oh my goodness, that's probably, let's talk about this. I, 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 I want to see clearly. I want all the specks out of my eye, and I want all the specks out of your eye so we can see life clearly together. It would, I, mean, I mean, imagine living in a community where you didn't have to hide anything. You knew you'd always be loved just the way you are. You see, there's a difference here. A lot of times what we do in our lives and in churches is we, we want to notice those specs. We want to change those specs because that makes us feel better. We're uncomfortable with the specs in other people's eyes. It makes us feel awkward. It makes our days more difficult or, or whatever. And so, so we want to get that speck out of their eyes so we feel better. It's not about them. It's not about sharing the community of Christ and building each other up in love. It's about fixing each other for our own gain. And that ain't right. But what a haven it would be. What a a place where we'd never have to live up to perfection to be loved. A place where we'd always be encouraged to grow closer to the truth and love. So what do we do with this? With this truth that we're actually called to be fruit inspectors and help each other to the truth of Christ? How How do we do this? Because Unfortunately, I, I, I would be a bad member of that community. I still get defensive when people point out my flaws and my sins. Sorry, I'm working on it. Jesus ain't through with me yet. And it isn't healthy to always try to fix each other's behaviors instead of loving each other how we are. So what do we do now? Now that we know that the point isn't that we never judge actions. The point is we never stand in judgment of others because we're all in the same boat. It isn't really healthy to live always trying to fix each other. What do we do? So, you know, I, I thought we'd look at um, Scripture. So we're going to go through some of the Psalms really quickly and hit some highlights. Maybe just, just, just look at the nuances of, 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 of what it might look like and not look like to, 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 to do this with each other, to help each other with the specs and the logs. Okay? So let's, let's, this is kind of an extended invitation time. If you're looking for the, so what do I do with this message, this is that part. Okay, so let's go ahead to, to our, first, our first proverb. Proverbs 9, 8. Don't rebuke a mocker or he will hate you. Rebuke the wise and he will love you. It's not always safe to point out the speck in the eye of a fellow believer. Even when you have a close eye on your eyes. If you move in love towards someone who won't listen, you may just be casting pearls before swine and what is holy before the dogs. It may not be the right time for speck pointing. If someone points out the speck in your own eye, 
while you're staring at the log in their own eye, the wise person may still prayerfully investigate the allegation because even a moron can be right. My old pastor used to say, nobody is smart enough to be all wrong. We have to walk in intimacy with the Spirit and in relationship with each other and manage the mess of our lives together. Sometimes we'll get defensive, sometimes we'll be overly judgmental, but even in that mess we can move toward Christ together in love because our failures together only highlight what we already know about each other. We all totally need Him together. Next proverb, Proverbs 26, 17. Like one who grabs a stray dog by the ears is someone who rushes into a quarrel not their own. <laughs> Isn't that a fun one? It's not always safe to point out the speck in the eye of a fellow believer, even when you have a close eye on your eyes. Sometimes it's just none of your business. We might be grabbing, grabbing a tiger by the tail for no good reasons. It's not our job to go around fixing people's behaviors. We have to keep an eye on our motivation. If we want to fix others so we can feel okay, that's called enmeshment. And it's not love. It may not be the right time for speck pointing. We have to walk in intimacy with the Spirit and in re relationship with each other and manage the mess of our lives together. Sometimes we'll get defensive, sometimes we'll be overly judgmental, but even in that mess we can move toward Christ together in love because our failures together only highlight what we already know about each other. We all need Him together. Proverbs 27.5, better is an open rebuke than hidden love. It's not loving it's not always loving to refuse to rebuke. Hidden love is a false love. And an open rebuke might be love in action. Sometimes we dodge the tension in relationship because we think it's more loving to not speak up or it's just easier. But when you dodge the tension, you dodge the real relationship and you just have this superficial relationship on the outskirts of tension. We have to walk in intimacy with the Spirit and in relationship with each other and manage the mess of our lives together. Sometimes we'll get defensive, sometimes we'll be overly judgmental, but even in that, we can move toward Christ together in love because our failures together only highlight what we already know about each other as we all need Him together. Proverbs 27, 9. Perfume and incense bring joy to the heart and the pleasantness of a friend springs from their heartfelt advice. Heartfelt advice from a friend can be some of the most pleasant aromas we encounter in life. But when someone comes with the wrong heart just wanting to change our behavior and not caring to do the relational work to understand where we are and why we're there and what we're going through and they just force advice on us when we're not ready for it, when we haven't given them permission, when we're not asking for it, man, that is not perfume. It just stinks. Keep your advice. Don't fix me. Love me. Always neglecting spec pointing, though, is not the answer. Because good, heartfelt advice is pleasant. We need to Psalm 4 for ourselves to make sure we're spotting the speck with a right heart. Psalm 4 4 says, tremble with anger and don't sin, but ponder. Actually, it says, speak to your own heart on your bed and be silent. So have all these emotions, have these thoughts, but, 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 but speak to your heart. Get alone with yourself. Why do you feel this way? Is this feeling true? If it is a true feeling, what's a healthy way to handle it? Psalm 4 for yourself means take inventory of your emotional, mental, spiritual state. Psalm 4 for yourself before you go to give advice. We have to walk in intimacy. I, I'm, I'm repeating this because I, I want to hammer out the fact that there's not a system of how we handle this all, all the time. Relationships don't boil down to a system. It's going to be messy. And even if there was a system, we'd screw it up. 
So the system isn't to dodge the mess of life. The system is learn how to manage the mess. And the good news about managing, managing the mess is we all know that we're all messy without Jesus. And we have Jesus, we have the truth together, and together we can build each other up in love. Last one, I think. Proverbs 27, 17. As iron sharpens iron, so one person sharpens another. We can walk in intimacy with the Spirit and in relationship with each other and manage the mess of our lives together and get sharper. Sometimes we'll get defensive. Sometimes we'll be overly judgmental. There's a lot of friction that takes place when iron sharpens iron. A lot of tension. But even in that, we can move toward Christ together in love because our failures together only highlight what we already know about each other. We all need Him together. And as we sharpen each other through that tension, we become better tools. If people says you're, someone said, hey man, you're a tool. Be like, thanks man, I've been sharpening iron with my <laughs> brothers and sisters in Christ. Don't say that, you'll get beat up. So let me, let, me, let me close with this. Has this been, I hope this has been eye-opening. I, I, I know it's, I'm not comfortable with this message because I, I like to come and, 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 and speak a, a, a very clear truth and then, and, then, and then leave with a very clear action step. Here's the truth. It's non-negotiable. Negotiable? Here's, here's what you do with it. But, but, but in this, it's, 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 it's relational. It's, it's, you got to walk in the Spirit. It's, it's, it's not always... But one thing we do know is, is that bad things are bad and good things are good. And, and God is the one who defines what is good and bad. And it's not bad to look at things in each other's lives and say, Hey, I think that's bad according to God's Word. And, and especially if... And, well, not especially. If we do that with a, with a spirit of humility and love. Psalm 4, pouring ourselves through all of that. But, but exactly how that works in our lives is not going to be a straight line system because you're going to get it wrong sometimes and I'm going to get it wrong sometimes. But, but I want to close with this, with all this stuff about looking at each other's lives and identifying good things and bad things and whatnot. I want, hear this. Our behaviors are symptoms, not the disease. If someone is struggling with a sin, that sin is not the problem. The problem is whatever emotional, mental, spiritual, relational need that that sin is meeting and what wound or what lie that person has received in the past to think that that's the way to meet that need. You know, there was a, I'm going to totally mess this up, but there was a, 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 a not an example, but a scientific experiment done with, with rats. And I'm going to mess this up, but I think we'll get the point across. I, I, they put rats in the cage, and in, in the cages, in, in the water, they put heroin in there. And so the rats went in, and, and, and the, but then they put another, another water thing in there that was, that was drug-free. And the, the rat went straight for the drugs. But then they put the rat in like this rat heaven with wheels to play on and, and then other rats and, and, and it was like the, the, all, everything that, that the rat could want including community same water bottles they went for the drugs then they stopped and left the drugs alone and just enjoyed the community that they were designed to enjoy if we just change the behaviors of people around us we're doing nothing. If we create an environment where we can live for how we've, we've been created to live, man, we'd be a force to be reckoned with in the most loving and humble and transforming ways. We can be a community that regulates behaviors and be super unhealthy. We can be a community of messy people with lingering bad behaviors who are growing in wholeness toward the true truth together and be super healthy. And I'd rather be a part of the messy people truly seeking wholeness 
than a group of shallow moralistic people seeking to puff up their spiritual pride through behavior modification of others. And to the best of my understanding, Jesus is with the messy people too. Hello, Pharisees. So, if you want to come get, point out a speck in my eye, might I suggest the following approach? Instead of saying, don't you know that's bad, Nick? Perhaps begin by praying for me. Maybe even fasting for me. And really seeking to understand me on a relational level. Not just understanding what I do, but me. And then, as we develop our relationship, and you earn trust, help me understand what role that bad behavior is playing in my life. Not so the behavior changes, but so we both grow in our knowledge and love of each other and of Christ. So don't judge the judgers for judging, but feel free to tell them they shouldn't judge. Let's pray. Father, we love you so much. And I thank you that you practiced this. <laughs> but even though you were equal with God, Lord Jesus, you were God, but you didn't consider equality with God as something that you could grab for yourself, but you humbled yourself. You poured yourself out, became a, a human, and, 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 and a servant, even to the point of death on a cross. That in, in, instead of pointing out how horrible people were and just fixing their behaviors, you taught us what our lives were really about and invited us, not out of a set of behaviors, but you invited us out of death into life, into our true selves, the true selves that you created, that only you can recreate in us. When you said, if you seek to save your life, you'll lose it, but if you lose your life for my sake, you'll save it. You wanted us to save our lives by losing the selves that we would claim for ourselves to let go and have you. So, as in all things, Lord Jesus, you are our forerunner. You are preeminent in all things. You've shown us how to love those who are doing wrong, not by fixing them, but for dying for them, stepping into their shoes. So teach us to love like that. Teach us to love ourselves like that that we might receive your love for us. Teach us to love each other like that, that we might grow in your love together. And teach us to love the world like that, that your name may be glorified among the nations. And we pray this for your glory and for our joy. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Let's sing together.
It's good to be a community of goobers. You know, goobers is actually, um, um, it came from something that, that, like, like a, 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 um, a silly person, a, I don't know, I don't know what is a PC way to say it, a, a goober, a dork, a whatever. And it actually, it came from talking about people from a section in Arkansas. So, hey, fa- hey father-in-law, hey, James. But the good news is, is we're, I, I Google it, it really is, it really does say like people from an area in Arkansas. <laughs> but listen, we're all goobers, we're all goobers, and, and, and you know, isn't it great to know that, that even, like, even like in the midst of your gooberishness, like the, the exact thing that you're, like maybe the thing you don't like about yourself, the thing that you really wish you could fix, whatever, like you are totally loved, man. You're totally loved. And, and man, to, to walk in that community together. Like I just, I want you to know. I am practicing that, as I love you just the way you are. If you annoy me, if you do something that I think is super wrong, I love you no matter what. And if, I am, if we ever get into a place where we have to look at the specks in each other's eyes together in Christ, I want you to know whether the speck stays or, or goes, I love you. You know, speckled or speckless. And I believe that that's true about you with me. I mean, at least some of you. Some of you, I don't know all that well, but some of you. And we're going to close with our blessing. Before we do that, um, I want to encourage you to continue worshiping God with your tithes and offerings. Um, Our um, offering plates are on the way out. Um, I say this most of the time. It's it's just important to me. Um, You know, as as, as much as sometimes Christians are, are seen as people who are judgmental, a lot of times churches are seen as groups who are just trying to get your money and manipulate you to get, to, to get your money. And, you know, God doesn't need your money. And, and really the truth of the matter is it's, it's all his money. And we don't tithe 10%, give God his percent, and then we keep our own and do what we want to do. With our, he's Lord of what we give and he's Lord of what we keep. And, and so we, we, we spend in honor of him as much as we give. And so whatever you do with your money, do it with love and joy before God, all right? And if that leads you to drop some money in the offering plate so we can have lights and internet, then that'll be great. Let's close with our our blessing from Ephesians. Receive this. Really think about this. Let's receive this together. Ephesians 3, 14 and following. Hmm. For this reason I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit towards your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth. And to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we could ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. Amen. You're dismissed.